When I consider my favorite westerns, John Ford's The Searchers shares the top spot among others because of its vast sweeping landscapes and sense of journey the film story delivers. It's also starring my favorite western film actor, John Wayne, whose characters never seem to change that much, yet he remains consistently entertaining and admirable. Anyone who watches the channel knows that Once Upon a Time in the West is another major favorite, and feel free to take a look at that video to understand all the reasons why. There are so many other classic and mainstream western movies that are a guilty pleasure, which makes objectively criticizing anything about the genre or its films difficult. I thoroughly enjoy the westerns for their moral simplicity and general linearity, whether it's the nostalgic black and white movies, the ridiculous crossover of sci-fi and western, or the long, drawn-out stories of any era. Nothing quite captivates me like a story of the Old West. However, there is a movie that takes one out of the recognizable comfort zone that most westerns lay their foundation in. That movie is Barbarossa, and I have a few reasons why it's worth a view. Originally released in 1982, Barbarossa saw little fanfare among nationwide audiences. This was of no fault of the movie itself, but of its handling by the studios. Whatever background politicking or business red tape that interfered in the movie truly taking off as a cultural gem of western movie making, there seems to be a fundamentally deeper reasoning for the film's lack of financial success and critical acclaim. Barbarossa is unlike any other western medium, although it borrows certain aspects from other western successes to create its own world. If watched on Blu-ray, the cinematography of the landscapes and natural world in which the characters thrive can be fully realized and appreciated. These lingering shots of the vistas and untamed environment appear to be a nod towards John Ford's work, yet the natural world never feels like a stage or prop that overwhelms the story. The surroundings blend together so well that every setting appears historical and believable within the story's transitioning. The establishing of the background environment is so important that the movie's opening title screen reflects the surrealism of the western world through its ghostly lighting. What is sublime is also deadly, as the natural world pricks and tears at the affable farm boy, Carl Westover, in the very first scene, drawing blood and foreshadowing both the allure and danger this wild west holds for the main characters. The spaghetti western seemed to have an influence in Barbarossa as well, because this world and the people within it aren't glossed over with fanciful nostalgia and pristine romanticism. There's a scene in a cantina that's gritty and tense with an enclosed suppressing space that's similar to a scene from Once Upon a Time in the West. The characters are sweaty with some dishevelment and Carl the farm boy looks as dirty and tired as one should be who just crossed the wilderness from Texas into Mexico. There's also the idea of the anti-hero represented by Willie Nelson's character for whom the movie is named after, Barbarossa. Similar to Clint Eastwood's Man With No Name, Barbarossa appears very self-serving and coldly calculating, willing to steal from anyone in order to survive and increase his loot. Gary Busey's character, Carl, joins Barbarossa on his illegal escapades and the pair find themselves on the run as banditos, similar to Butch Cassidy in The Sundance Kid. All of these similarities would appear to set the stage for Barbarossa to fulfill itself as a 90 minute homage to the westerns that came before it, but the movie steers away from telling a story already heard a hundred times over. It does this by shading everything and everyone in gray, blurring the lines of good and bad and offers a story of moral complexity as no one is what they seem. Barbarossa could easily have filled the role of a John Wayne character, righteous in his vengeance to right a grievous wrong, but he instead hides from his main antagonist reluctant to kill the very men that charge him with death in their eyes. And before he gets lumped in with the individualistic natures of other anti-heroes, Barbarossa reveals a gentler, humanistic side to his personality when he forms and retains a partnership with Carl. He may show the farm boy tough love, but he never truly abandons Carl. Despite Barbarossa's tendency to steal from the old and poor, we learn that his accumulated wealth is all for love and family. Barbarossa is a man with a dream, who seeks to escape the vicious cycle of stalking death and constant running. 
but he has become more than merely a man. Amid his exploits, he has become legend, mythical, and ghostly. While Barbarossa may wish to find a place of peace for his family and himself, he cannot easily let go of the reputation he has built around his name. His duality consists of both the egotistical and compassionate, both family man and road warrior. However, this sympathetic representation of Barbarossa's character cannot hold, as when he returns to his wife, he refers to his child as a baby, although she seems to be a full-grown woman, or at least a teenager. He also rebukes the concerns of his wife by excusing his prolonged absences with what can be paraphrased as, I show up eventually, don't I? And as excellent a gunslinger as he is, Barbarossa fails to end the life of his mortal enemy, even when he has him dead to rights within his sight. Finally, Barbarossa takes great pleasure in translating the Spanish songs about his adventure, glorifying in his own mythos, which suggests that he never truly wishes to be free of his vagabond life. He can never settle down and know a life of peace because he's addicted to the celebrity status of his own name. The most comforting word Carl gives him is not a promise to take care of Barbarossa's wife and daughter, but to protect the reputation, to ensure the legend lives on. Through Carl's perspective, the mythical becomes tangible, and the aura of Barbarossa's name is nullified by the farm boy's ignorance. Carl is an oafish sidekick and causes more harm than good to the legend's reputation by preventing him from robbing an old couple and tossing away the gold they stole. Carl humanizes Barbarossa by bringing out the paternal instincts within him and exposing the tricks behind the magic. Although Carl's story may be similar to Barbarossa's, the two diverge in their narrative in several distinct ways. Carl moves back home with intentions to stay, whereas Barbarossa sneaks home but remains on the run. Carl never kills the men after him, whereas Barbarossa has killed sons, brothers, and cousins of the family he married into. Carl's original sin may have been an accident, whereas Barbarossa admits his guilty actions from his wedding night. And finally, Carl is able to face the man who hounds him, whereas Barbarossa and Don Braulio never received closure. Carl represents the transition from youthful innocence into adulthood yet never loses his personal attributes or convictions by becoming the hardened, surly outcast Barbarossa turned into. Even in the final scene, when Carl has taken the mythical mantle of Barbarossa and has both Don Braulio and Eduardo in his sights for a kill shot, he embraces his merciful side like usual and chooses life over death, the life of Barbarossa's legend over the death of his enemies. Barbarossa and Carl are lost characters seeking to fulfill a sense of purpose. Barbarossa finds his purpose in ensuring his reputation will live on into perpetuity, while Carl seeks to bring his family back to prominence and undo the damage he has done at home. Consistently on their heels is Eduardo, played by actor Danny De La Paz, whose character has been given a sense of purpose by Don Braulio and the atmosphere of his community. Upon his introduction, Eduardo is presented as eager and relentless, in his pursuit of Barbarossa, but the choice of his motivation was not his to make. Barbarossa exposes Eduardo's manipulated sense of purpose by reminding him of the consequences of death upon the ones he cares for back at home. However, letting go seems to be the most difficult lesson to learn, as D'Ambrali and Barbarossa cannot let go of each other's insults and injury upon the other. Herman Palmeyer cannot let go of his bloodlust for Carl. Josefina cannot let go of Barbarossa despite his showing no true inclination of settling down. And so too, Eduardo cannot let go of the mission he was sent to complete, even if it means his death. Perhaps there is symbolism to be found in the final altercation between Eduardo and Barbarossa, but the overarching context of almost every character's inability to let go results in them losing everything. Even Eduardo must suffer this consequence as his decision to follow through on his mission brings about his humiliation in the eyes of Don Braulio and the community, creating a specter of impending doom for his actions against Barbarossa. There are no final, over-the-top shootouts and showdowns like a Sam Peckinpah movie, because the story of Barbarossa is more personal and intimate than most other westerns. This is a story about pride and ego, and the mortal danger of the two becoming indistinguishable. A true sense of pride requires integrity, but ego thrives on doubt. 
worked out that Barbarossa, a man introduced as a killer in both his backstory and the first time we see him on screen, could ever be a family man. Doubt that Carl, saved from starvation, enslavement, captivity, and aloneness by Barbarossa, could ever discover a self-identity on his own. Doubt that Eduardo, full of the stories and songs passed down in the oral tradition, could see through the manipulations of Don Braulio and accept that Barbarossa is not his enemy. If one tunes out the emotional levity of the music, does this film turn into a story of a tragic hero? Does the ending signify a continuous cycle of more violence yet to come? Should one resign him or herself to a happy life faced with inevitable death? Or is it better to seek immortality? Have a watch and see for yourself. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. We're working to get our videos done on a more consistent basis, so thank you for all of your patience and support. We've got a long list of other topics to review, and here are a few that we'll be doing in the future, so I hope you stay with us to check them out. We're also considering opening a Patreon account, so if there's anything extra you'd like us to provide for that, leave us a comment and let us know, because our subscribers are going to help us grow and mold this channel into something specially for them. So if you haven't subbed us already, please do. Likes and shares help immensely. So thanks for everything. We'll see you next time.